Thank you very much, Karen. Um, all I can say is I hope I have my ass with me when I leave today. <laughs> no, no intimidation there at all. Um, um, thank you, uh, Matt, as well, and uh, and David and Ray from um, uh, from all of you for uh, welcoming here, uh, welcoming me here, and giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about my work at the at the FTC, uh, particularly my work that has touched upon uh, taxi regulation. Now, in part, um, uh, Karen and Matt asked me to talk a little bit more broadly about, you know, like, why the heck did you start nosing around taxi business? Um, so what I'd first like to do is, is talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the general purpose of what we call our advocacy program. Um, uh, we do a lot of that, and I'll explain a little bit of, of what we do and how the taxi advocacies fit into that. Um, I'm also going to talk about transportation apps in, in context. Um, it, is, it is certainly no surprise to any of you that what you're seeing in your industry and in your sector uh, is part of a far broader and larger phenomena in the, uh, in the economy. Uh, and there are many industries that are being disrupted um, uh, by new kinds of technologies. And I thought it would be helpful to put it in, in context. Uh, and then I'll turn to um, the transportation uh, advocacies that we have done uh, and offer a few um, thoughts about that. Um, and hopefully there will be time for me to answer any questions. Um, disclaimer is that uh, these are the views of me and my capacity as the director of the Office of Policy Planning. Um, uh, it is pretty standard that we disclaim these are not the views of the commission or any commissioner. Um, then they would have to vote on every slide, every, uh, every speech that we give, and I don't think they'd like to do that. By the way, the commissioners themselves use a similar disclaimer. Um, you basically have to have a vote of a majority um, to represent that something is the view of the commission. So let's talk a little bit about our advocacy program, which we consider to be a core component of our mission, and it's something that generally originates in, in my office. Um, the FTC has a dual mission, and we think of it as a dual mission, and it derives from our statute, Section 5 of the FTC Act, which dates back to 1914. Um, we have a competition mission, and we have a consumer protection mission. And we are um, vested with authority to prohibit unfair methods of competition, and also unfair or deceptive acts or practices. And for those of you who have had an opportunity to look at some of our taxi-related advocacies, you will see, especially the more recent, the DC one, was divided into competition issues and consumer protection issues, some of which are related to the data and data privacy questions that come up um, whenever mobile platforms are in use. Um, we have a variety of tools. Um, uh, enforcement actions are one, um, but my office does not do the enforcement. That's done by the Bureau of Competition and the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Uh, my office does a lot of the study and advocacy work, and those are important tools that we use. Sometimes they lay the foundation for future enforcement efforts, uh, but a lot of the time it is for us uh, an opportunity to advocate for competition. Again, this is 101 and all of you know this, but it sort of bears uh, repeating and reflecting on that competition is not just about price, it's about quality, it's about variety, it's about service. I heard a lot of that from your speakers this morning, that it's about providing quality service to um, consumers, uh, but it's also about innovation. It's about new products and even new business models um, that may challenge um, uh, traditional ones. The key is to be nimble and responsive to consumers. And so one of the things we look for in our advocacy program is any kind of regulatory effort to interfere with that feedback mechanism from consumers. When consumers are voting and saying they want something, we get very concerned about regulatory efforts that try to, um, uh, try to short circuit that effort. So how can competition be undermined? Um, basically, falls down to collusion and exclusion. Competition can suffer when coordination displaces competition, when firms start coordinating with each other, and competition can suffer when you have dominant firms or firm, groups of firms in a dominant position that seek to exclude new rivals. Um, that also, you see the bottom of both of them is, both of those can harm consumers, they can limit innovation, they can facilitate higher prices, lower quality, and lower service. So those are sort of the two things that we are always looking for, whether it's in conduct or in regulation. Um, our advocacy mission is to support and promote competition and consumer protection principles. Um, we share our expertise with policymakers and the public. We talk about the benefits of competition. We talk about harms from restrictions on competition. We highlight other consequences for consumers. Uh, and we 
try very hard to discourage the use of legislation or regulation that would undermine competition. Um, and we do this with federal agencies, regulators, state and local governments, and even private standard setting organizations. Uh, we recently did one in the, uh, with the Marine Something Council, um, uh, which adopts standards for certifying whether or not fish have been mined in a sustainable way. Um, and the definitions that they were adopting would affect a lot of um, supermarkets selling sustainable fish, and we were concerned about the consumer protection message that they were sending. So we do a wide variety of, of things, sometimes formal and sometimes informal. The formal side would be letters, comments, sometimes testimony. Uh, some of them are by specific invitation. One of our uh, advocacies in the taxi area, the one we did in Anchorage, was by specific invitation from a councilwoman who asked us to comment on the draft bill. Um, sometimes uh, open public comment periods, as was true in both Colorado and DC. We also do amicus briefs, we do reports and policy papers, we hold conferences and workshops. Um, informally, we often consult with legislators or regulators, peer-to-peer um, -peer within the federal government, um, and staff-to-staff -staff consultation. Often we're giving input on draft laws or regulations. All of it is designed to promote, again, the views of competition and sensitivity to competition. We do 20 to 25 formal advocacy letters and amicus briefs per year. Um, most of them originate out of my office, sometimes out of other offices. Um, the recent areas of interest, our biggest area right now has been healthcare and healthcare professionals. Um, as you know, it's a changing marketplace in healthcare, and we had a number of instances where we see physicians trying to limit what nurses can do through regulation. Uh, we've seen dentists trying to limit what dental hygienists can do through regulation. Um, an interesting one that recently came to us is uh, an accreditation organization trying to limit the accrediting of education programs for a subspecialty that could challenge, uh, in a competitive way, um, higher level professionals. Um, we get dozens of these, dozens of these come to our attention and requests every year, um, and we try to target our, our uh, attention. Uh, we do a lot of work in the intellectual property area, patents and standards, a lot of electricity regulation, consumer privacy and identity theft has been an increasing area of concern, as you all know. We did one in, in uh, attorney advertising that I won't get into the specifics because it was pretty weird stuff. Um, but basically, an attempt by attorneys to limit the kind of advertising that other attorneys could do, but it was very targeted at particular kinds of attorneys. There shall be no advertising using sirens in the background, things like that. Um, oh, you got it, all right. Uh, smart group. Uh, and yes, we did um, three um, this, uh, this current year. We did three involving motor vehicle transportation in Colorado, Anchorage, and the District of Columbia. In approaching the regulatory process, we are informed by what is a very well-known and accepted theory. It's called capture theory. Um, and it's the concern that sometimes regulators and the regulated become too close. Um, and it is a function of who has the resources and who has the concentrated interest. Um, consumers are much more dispersed. The people affected directly by regulation are much more concentrated and focused, and their voices can be louder, and they can try to use the regulatory process to basically um, uh, assist themselves, um, entrench themselves and the model that benefits them. Um, think about um, at the federal level, um, this is a big issue in communications, the FCC, and a big issue it was in banking, um, uh, where the regulators and the regulated are talking to each other. They cycle in and out of each other's businesses, um, and sometimes the concern becomes that the consumer is not being heard, uh, and that's what we consider to be part of our role, is to try and express what the concern of consumers uh, would be. Um, there's a, there was a, a short article on NPR back in, uh, in June that found some seven, 17th century London events uh, between ferrymen who controlled the transportation of people and things on the Thames uh, and what was then a new phenomena, carriages. Uh, the term hack comes, as probably many of you, if not all of you know, from Hackney, which was the, the London cabbie, but it started as carriage. Transport on the Thames constituted a vested interest of great concern to the watermen. 
and each successive improvement in locomotion and transport has had to face opposition from the representatives of established but threatened conditions. I'll have a little poem later on written by one of the guys at the same time. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that this idea of, of capture, this idea of trying to use the regulatory process to protect incumbents is not new at all. It is very old and it's very well um, established uh, concern. So let's talk a little bit about taxi, taxi apps in the broader context of the new economy. Um, this is a, a snapshot of a, um, uh, of a web page I, I'd call your attention to if you're not a, a, a aware of it. It's called Meshing It. Um, if you Google or, or Bing uh, Meshing It or DuckDuckGo Meshing It, um, you will find this. Uh, it is a web page that's devoted to the share economy. Um, and let's see, there's a, yeah. If you notice right here, the middle tab here is called mobility. Um, and it links to lots of different kinds of mobility-related share economy apps. Um, but I also wanted to call your attention to the numbers on the left side here. 8,400 companies, 135 countries, uh, and down here at the bottom, $21 billion in commerce. Um, this is a booming sector of not only the U.S. economy, but the global economy. And it is being affected in many different ways across many different industries. And many of them, yes, have had traditional regulatory frameworks that are being pushed and tested and pulled um, uh, by, um, by these new kinds of services. I don't know how many of you have followed at all in the news the problems that Tesla has, but uh, for decades and decades, going back to the 1930s, uh, dealer and dealer organizations at the state level have successfully passed laws that prohibit the sale of automobiles except through a dealership. And such laws exist in, I think it's over 30 states now. And what it's meant is that Tesla, which wants to sell an electric car over the internet in a different way through galleries and malls, uh, and I could go on about what's different about their business model, they are facing regulatory resistance, lawsuits, because the dealers are not so much afraid of the 20,000 cars a year that Tesla sells, but it's what Tesla represents. Because if the dealership network is no longer mandated by law, if it was subject to competition, it wouldn't only be Tesla, but it might be Ford and General Motors and future entrants from China and India that might want to try and sell cars in different ways. And of course, the justification is this is what's good for consumers, consumers like the local dealerships, but there are studies that show that the dealerships add cost. Um, and so another area where you have a new business model it's affected by the product, the electric car, but it's really just a new business model. No, here's the part of the dealership that sells. Here's the part that does service. Quite different. They download updates remotely from their factory and reboot your car if you run into electronic problems. Um, there are only six moving parts in the drivetrain. Um, it's just a different model, and they're having a heck of a time introducing it into the marketplace. So. Is there any turning back? I think there was um, uh, some discussion this morning, especially on the last panel, that um, uh, not to beat Orwell um, uh, to death, which also came up this morning, but this horse has left the barn. Um, this is happening, and it's happening in a big way. This is just the current, uh, this is the sales figures for 2012. This is just Android, and this is the iPhone, and this is the poor Blackberry, and, and Windows uh, down at the bottom here. But you probably can't see it, but this figure right here is a billion. And this figure up here is a billion and a half. And that's where we are per quarter in terms of mobile phone sales. If you missed it in the paper today, Apple sold 9 million iPhones in three days this week when it introduced its no new phone. So what does that mean? Well. Think about app downloads and apps available, and yes, this is not my typo, it's off of this, uh, this website, not my problem at all, a valuable, uh, not my word, okay? <laughs> but total app downloads, again, you probably can't see it, but this is 50 billion. And this is annual, 2013, and this is both Android and Apple. Notice how Apple can actually get the app downloads even with far fewer devices. Um, shows you that you know, the, the buyer of the Apple phone, it's all about the apps. But we're talking about 100 billion downloads and over here, um, hundreds of thousands of apps that are available. So 
This really isn't directed at you because I think you know this, but this is a reflection on the voices and I'll talk about the voices that you're all hearing because I know you are because we've been hearing them too. Um, and the big question is, do you want to fight the wave or do you want to ride the wave? Uh, and I think there's plenty of examples historically um, that suggest that riding the wave is going to be a far more successful strategy for consumers. And that goes for the businesses that are engaged in the industry and it goes for the four-sided uh, regulators that facilitate change. As I'll talk about, it doesn't mean you don't focus on appropriate consumer needs. But fighting the wave, I think, is going to be a mistake. And these were not chosen randomly. Telex fought the telephone and tried to use regulatory means to keep the telephone from coming into business. We all know the story about the telephone, which fought long distance. And if AT&T had not been broken up, chances are the uh, 150 um, uh, smartphones that I suspect are in this room right now uh, might not be here. The record, well, they have fought hard and we're still seeing battles over digital content. I skipped by the, uh, the CD because we're really in the era where, um, uh, where digital download is disrupting books, music, all kinds of video content. The market is trying to adjust to that new world. And I threw in the typewriter just because it made me you know, kind of think of law school and uh, <laughs> the first draft had to be really good. Railroads, by the way, railroads tried to use regulators to stop truckers in the 1950s and early 1960s. The building of the interstate road system by the government in the 1950s completely changed mobile transportation and the railroads were not happy and they tried to use regulations to limit the truckers. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, transportation regulation today and the apps um, uh, and what we've had to say about them. First of all, we've had a long-standing interest in transportation regulation and, and innovation. Uh, and I add innovation because from our perspective, what's happening in your sector is just one part of a larger picture of the economy um, uh, and a long-standing interest that we've had in making sure competitive conditions are, are, um, are robust to facilitate innovation. Uh, in 1984, we did a, a staff report on taxi cab regulation. Um, it was prepared by our Bureau of Economics. And there were, um, as Al was talking about this morning, there were two enforcement actions that were brought in Minneapolis and New Orleans. Uh, in those days, it was more about um, uh, issuing medallions and limiting issuance of medallions. It was a, a simpler issue. Uh, in 2008, I, I included this because I wanted you to realize, and this is the, uh, the International Association, and some of you are from abroad, um, this is a bigger issue than the U.S. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and in 2008, they have a, the group has 50 to 60 countries who all participate on their competition committee, and they meet two or three times a year to discuss issues of, of interest in the competition community, and in 2008, the issue was taxi regulation. It has changed so much since then, so quickly, that I've been told just recently they may be taking up taxis again and looking at it because the issue of applications and how they integrate into the regulatory scheme uh, is an international issue. And this year we did our, our three advocacies in Colorado and Anchorage and DC. And I, I hope those of you who haven't looked at them uh, will have an opportunity to do so. You will see that they are a little bit different. The regulatory issues in each jurisdiction were a little bit different. Uh, Anchorage was really just focused on uh, liberalizing their medallion issuance over a period of time. Uh, but there too, we encourage them to think further down the road and think about apps as well. Um, but in all of it is in context, our broader interest in innovation, technologies, and new methods of business. We've done studies of e-commerce and the internet, search and advertising. Amazon, if any of you are Amazon fans, has a wine store, uh, and they can't ship wine to many states because of traditional regulations that limit the shipping of wine. We had an invitation to do an advocacy. It turned out the bill died, so we didn't do it. But there was a state where wine wholesalers introduced a bill, it was called an at-rest bill that required every case of wine to come to rest in that state for a minimum period of 48 hours before it could be sold. What was the justification for it? It's pretty good for the wholesalers because they knew that every case of wine coming into that state, they would get to wholesale 
put in their warehouse for at least two days. Fortunately, that bill didn't go anywhere. It had no consumer protection justification at all. It was strictly about one industry trying to get a law that would ensconce it um, and give it a piece of the action. Um, mobile platforms, we have done a lot about recently, and a mix of issues, both competition and consumer protection issues. So what are the goals of our transportation advocacies? Um, I've tried to boil it down to a single slide. Um, uh, obviously, we explain it in greater detail in the advocacies themselves. But there are things we want to promote and, and encourage and things that we would like to discourage. What would we like to promote and encourage? Regulations that support and facilitate healthy competition. And the subcontext for that is sensitivity to the competitive harms of some regulations. It's important as you approach some of the regulations, especially in this area where the harm may not always be obvious, to really think about sometimes the subtleties. And we'll talk about a little bit later the problem of there being just a completely new model that doesn't fit the existing regulation. And the question is, how do you approach that when it's such a different model? And before you restrict it, think about the impact of the restriction, the specific restriction on competition. One of the things you'll see if you look at our three advocacies is we're not opposing the regulation of the industry. We're not opposing broad regulations. What we have seen are amendments that are very, very specific. And we have targeted particular examples to say, well, here's an example of one that might well have a very anti-competitive effect. What's the benefit for consumers? And we're trying to do that in a sense, modeling how we think about things to share that with regulators, um, to encourage regulators to think about it in the same way. Regulations that redress real harms to consumers, real safety, security, transparency, honesty issues, yes. We don't take a position against that and we haven't taken a position against that, but we like to see that they are no greater than necessary. When you see an actual problem advised, but a sledgehammer solution proposed, there's reason to be concerned that the true concern is not really about the evidence-based problem, but that it's some broader uh, interest in reducing competition. So what do we want to discourage? Um, we want to discourage protecting and entrenching current competitors and current business models. I have a slide in the moment I'll share with you, and I've had this conversation with a number of people in the industry. It has been this way for a very long time. There's taxis, there's sedans, and there's limousines. And I don't know why it has to be that way forever. And that's a really hard and disruptive question for all of you to ask. But I think that one of the things that the apps, whether they are being done by third parties or non-third parties are doing, is it's showing that consumers of, especially of this generation, we've been making fun of the millennials, but the, the smartphone generation, the smartphone generation may not see those distinctions in the same way um, that they have traditionally been seen. Raising the cost of new entry and creating impediments to new sources of competition. We're very sensitive to that. When we see a restraint that clearly is going to impede entry, make entry more expensive, we want to know what's the justification. Are you serving some real public interest? And finally, we look and uh, become concerned about steps that inhibit market responsiveness to consumer preferences. Um, there's a famous case, 1984, in the Supreme Court involving the NCAA, where the NCAA used blanket contracts. They said, uh, all television rights will flow through us, and we're going to negotiate with, back then, the big networks, and we're going to get a lot of money by selling a blanket license. You take it all or none at all. And two of the schools that had really good football teams back then, University of Oklahoma and the University of Georgia sued, and they said, this is a restraint on competition. What you're really doing is you are cutting off the television audience and the television audience feedback. Of course, what was the sub story? The television audience wants to see us. We're real football teams. And what you're doing is you're selling this blanket license. We get less. Other people wind up with more than their share and competition on the merits is undermined. Now, they lost, the NCAA lost, and in the following year, there was an increase in the number of televised college football games, a change in the mix of games that were available, and the actual cost went way down for the networks, which created the possibility for, other than the big networks, to actually bid for some of the contracts. Um, the core of that case, though, was that the NCAA had cut off the importance of consumer preference. 
there was no feedback mechanism to show what the demand side was. So some closing thoughts. As I said, I, I love the Checker Marathon. I, I looked really hard to get a good picture of the Checker Marathon because it's the first taxi I remember. And I'm sure that a lot of you remember the Checker Marathon with the little jump seats in the back. Um, as a kid, that was about the coolest taxi you could ever get on the street. But is this really what it's going to look like in 2020? So here's my ferryman and poet John Taylor, who wrote this in 1622 about those early coaches. Coaches and Flanders mares do rob us of our shares, our wares, our fares. Against the ground we stand and knock our heels whilst all our profit runs away on wheels. Update for the current time, and I know, I know that you are hearing some of these same sorts of complaints from the people in the industry. And these are complaints about competition. These are not complaints about protecting consumers. On the left side here, the Lysine conspiracy of the 1990s, one of the worst price-fixing conspiracies uh, in history. Um, I'm not likening this to your industry. I'm using the quotation for a different point because this was a criminal conspiracy. People went to jail. Fines were in uh, the excess of $500 million. It was the highest fine to date ever imposed on a global conspiracy. That's not what I want this for here today. You're not doing anything. I haven't seen anything in your industry like that. But look at that quotation, and I will bet you have seen things like that or heard things like that. Our competitors are our friends. Our customers are the enemy. This was caught on grainy undercover tapes of the conspirators in a hotel room in Hawaii. And on the right side here, I'm offering you some things that have come to our attention from the industry in the last couple of months. It will take all of us working together to eliminate this threat. New competitors want you and your family on food stamps and welfare. It's not a question of being consumer friendly. That was a video interview. Well, to my competition ears, that top one is an invitation to collude. That's somebody saying, come on, we gotta work together and stop this new form of competition. And these bottom two, well, this is not about the public interest. To coin a phrase used by Karen, this is about covering your ass in the competitive way from competition. Okay, oh, I didn't throw you under a bus, did I? No! So I ask you to perk up your ears when you hear that. Um, uh, I think you all know it. I think you all know the difference between people who are advocating on their own behalf versus people who are advocating on the public interest. But it makes all the difference in what kind of regulatory scheme is going to come out of the current period of change. And in a sense, all of you are competitors. Um, Brandeis's famous uh, phrase, description of the states, that the states are laboratories for change. You are all laboratories for change. It's helpful to have a model regulation that gets you started thinking about it, but then you will compete among yourselves for different solutions. And that competition will produce a variety of solutions that are better or worse fit for your different jurisdictions. Gee, what's this all about? Kind of looks like a square peg in a round hole. So I close with my theory of life and people and regulation. I offer this to my students on occasion. And not to be patronizing, I just kind of like it. There's two kinds of people and there's two kinds of regulation. There's bangers. People who are bangers, you know, you present them with a new idea and they have a preconceived notion. What do they do with the new idea? They bang the heck out of it until it fits into their preconceived notion. But then there are shapeshifters. And shapeshifters confronted with something new are willing to question the old. And they're willing to shift. Maybe it's time for a round hole for this new peg to fit into. Thank you very much for your patience, and I'm happy to take any questions. We don't actually have an extra mic in here, so if anybody has a question, I invite you to please stand up and project. Can you hear it in the back? 
We've heard a lot about ride-sharing apps over the last couple of days. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on them. I think the ride-sharing apps present different consumer protection issues um, uh, than the ones related to taxis, sedans, and limousines. Um, and I, I, am, I am happy that California is trying to work through those issues. Um, I would much rather like to see a solution that allows them to exist in some way, again, because they are, I, I was, uh, oh, my, one of my friends was accusing me of focusing too much on copulation. That really wasn't the point, but what are ride-sharing apps? It's as if eBay and Facebook had offspring. And there's a social element to the ride sharing, there's a social element that appeals to people, but there's this commercial side to it that's sort of, you know, like eBay where you're bidding on things. It is something new, but I do think that there are some harder consumer protection issues, uh, and, and we would not disagree with that. But the solution is not necessarily, it may be it's not solvable, but the solution is not necessarily say, oh, therefore they can't exist. Um, it may be to figure out how to do it in a reasonable way. I'm not sure that taxi commissions are the right way to do it. It could be there are other regulatory bodies that will get engaged in it. Um, there are legitimate consumer protection concerns. Um, I think the insurance issue is a, is a real issue. Hi, I was interested in your uh, capture theory uh, slide particularly because, and, and the discussion about collusion. The IATR has taken time uh, over the last year and a half to work through public hearing and through feedback to create model regulations. And I saw the kind of reference you had between regulated and regulators and the consumers when actually it was the consumer that was the springboard for this. And I'm wondering if first, based on what you've said, is there a concern even though the ABA and other groups do this, uh, in putting forth model regulations as a menu for regulators to uh, face local consumer protection and public safety concerns. And the second is where I think your model doesn't work is in your capture theory slide, I remember you said resources and concentrated efforts and interests. And in this particular new world, the financial resources and the concentrated efforts are not on the regulator side. So I'd like to see if you can comment that. That's really what's new here, too. Sure, sure. So on the, on the back half question, I think it's still very much concentrated in the hands of the taxi industry in local jurisdictions, to varying degrees. Um, and what you're seeing is tension between, it's sort of a classic tension, right? Outside money and local entrenched interests and the, the regulatory body is where the battle is taking place. Although not always. Um, in DC, the city council adopted a statute, asked the commission to implement the statute, uh, and it has been going back and forth because of, you know, frankly, differences between what appeared to be their intention and what came out in, in the actual uh, regulations. Um, in terms of capture theory, I'm really thinking about um, uh, the not collusion at the regulators level, but at the industry level. Um, and yes, many trade groups, trade associations, professional associations like this one do a lot of good work by coming up with sort of model suggestions and sample suggestions. They do the, the hard initial work that creates something for people to discuss. I think the problem arises, and this is true for all trade associations, is if it goes over the line from model and suggested to discussions in the hallway about, well, if you do it, I'll do it. Um, and that's the thing that you have to be concerned, any trade association have to be concerned about. Famous case involving lawyers, Virginia State Board uh, um, versus Goldfarb, where the lawyers tried to use their, board, their um, rules of ethics to create minimum fee schedules. Um, uh, and it wasn't recommended fee schedules, it was, this is what it is. National Society of Professional Engineers, 1978, through their ethics rules, they outlawed any kind of competitive bidding. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You can't outlaw competitive bidding because you think it will be dangerous for the public. Um, so there's examples where trade groups go too far and it becomes, you know, the reality, not just a recommended practice. In those cases, those Regulators are coming forth with the proposal for regulators to choose from. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying what would be lawful or unlawful. I think it would be a loss of opportunity if the agreement was made, oh, let's all go forward with this, instead of really thinking about unique solutions.
Gavin, I'd be remiss to my airport groups if I didn't point out the fact that almost all of our services are competitively bid, franchises and other things from time to time. So when we meet, uh, it is not collusion, it's a discussion over how to improve the services. Let me turn my other hat on, though, in terms of an academic and having taught transport law, although not being an attorney. There's a covenant between a regulated firm uh, and the regulator. And that covenant is that I will give up certain abilities to charge whatever fee I want. Uh, I will do certain things, whatever the regulatory group wants me to do. And that is, in return, you'll protect me from ruinous competition. That's usually the covenant between the regulated and the regulatory firm. Here we have a situation, and I was party to a group in a large city a few weeks ago where the ride-sharing folks were coming in saying, oh, it's so great, this is a social movement, uh, it's so, yeah, we meet friends, and I do this, and I do that. At the same forum in front of the city council, a taxi driver gets up and says, I spend five, $6,000 a year for commercial insurance. I have to pay these fees, and yet these people can offer the same services to the customer at a much lower price because they pay no fees. Um, I have to make sure that I'm vetted. I have to make sure I have not committed any crimes in order to drive. And I think what we have out there is this dichotomy that's going on of some people basically following the rules of the regulated and being far more costly than some of the new alternatives which aren't vetted don't drive the same kind of vehicle, are not inspected, and I think there is concern for the public safety that regulators aren't doing their jobs by enforcing the rules which are on the books at this time. Certainly, it's within a purview of well-funded agencies to come in and try to change those rules, but it is also not legally permissible to come in and operate illegally and take somewhat of the, of the bread out of the mouths of these drivers. But Gavin is, uh, the other question, sorry about that. The uh, two academics get together, you never do this. The real question I had was that in teaching that transport law, I always thought that if you were a regulated firm, you could collude. Rate bureaus and other things, uh, literally you could set prices together because they were under the umbrella of the regulatory agency. Is there any concern that these new apps, or whatever name they are, that by them setting the rates and not being regulated, not protected by this regulatory umbrella, that by them setting the rates with all these different providers out there and they don't have a broker's license, uh, like a trucking company or anything like that, that they're in violation of federal antitrust law in terms of setting of rates, inclusion. Um, I appreciate the, the comment, uh, and, and before I respond, it reminds me, your first comment, that part of the reason I was eager to come here is because I would like to learn more about your perspectives. Um, uh, we have spoken with a number of people in the industry. Um, we have heard from a number of people in the industry. I've got my contact information up here for a reason, um, uh, and, and I believe um, my slides will be made available to you. So uh, I am happy to hear from you if you have perspectives that you want to share. Whether you agree with me, don't agree with me. Um, uh, our agency needs to be informed by people in the industry, and you are those people, at least at the regulatory level, um, and so I welcome those contacts. We've talked with, with some of you. We've had good conversations with Karen. Uh, as Al uh, Lagasse mentioned this morning, we've talked to him. So I welcome uh, others as well. Um, as far as whether apps are violating antitrust laws, I, I don't know. I have to look into it. I can't really give an opinion on that one. Any more questions? I, I, have, I have one quick question. Um, two things. Al had mentioned this morning, and we just want to get some clarity from you on this, um, that after the enforcement actions that took place years ago, I think it was in New Orleans and somewhere else, that there was a finding that regulators are exempt from any type of actions. And the other, the other pressing question too, I don't know how much this really came out this morning, is the other side of the shoe, which is what about big monopolies or people that are well-financed coming in and steamrolling people who don't have the resources and taking over an industry? I mean, there's a Chicago lawsuit there are private rights of action that attorney generals have. And I guess what we're concerned is, what is the, T the FTC's enforcement authority on those? And does the FTC have the ability, if you were so inclined and had a different viewpoint, to say, you know what? We want to go after those who are operating without licenses, who are getting an unfair advantage because they just choose 
to violate the law? I mean, that's, I think, a lot of people had had that question. Um, and also, my understanding is that regulators have sovereign immunity as government regulators and the ability to talk about free speech-wise ideas, which we did with our model regs. And I think you told me offline that our model regs and our process is okay. We just want to make sure that we're cool on that because we, we, we just, we're, we're, this is a member service, you know, we're trying to help our regulators. All right, you heard it first here. That is cool. That's cool. It's a, it's a, the, the view of my office is that Matt's cool. Um, so, so first on the on the uh, the issue Al raised this morning about the 1984 um, congressional statute, um, uh, it was um, it was uh, at the same time as the two um, uh, uh, taxi cases in Minneapolis and New Orleans, but it was directly in response to a Supreme Court decision called City of Boulder, which involved the cable TV industry. And what the statute says is you cannot seek damages. It was really about private lawsuits, that you cannot seek treble damages from local, um, basically municipal or municipally related authorities. It had no effect on the FTC's enforcement authority. Uh, our enforcement authority, though, does not involve damages. Um, uh, we issue cease and desist orders. Um, we can seek fines for violation of the cease and desist order, um, but we don't have any authority to um, uh, collect fines for violations. So that was the, the adjustment. The adjustment was to take away the threat of damages to municipalities, um, uh, it doesn't mean that the FTC Act doesn't apply. Um, and you can look at some recent cases. We brought cases against um, a hospital group in Georgia that went to the United States Supreme Court, decided in our favor, uh, it's called Phoebe Putney, and it had to do with whether they were immune from uh, the FTC's authority. And North Carolina Board of Dentistry, recently we won a case in the Fourth Circuit, again dealing with our authority to uh, pursue cases against um, local boards that were um, uh, governmental boards in some sense. Uh, so ho hopefully that clarifies that issue. And what was the, oh, the, um, there's a big difference in how we think of monopoly versus big money. Big money is not the same in antitrust terms as monopoly. Um, uh, and although some of the apps apparently have some, um, some good financing behind them, that doesn't make them uh, a monopoly in our view. Uh, and no, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't uh, pretend to have any authority to go after them for violating local statutes and regulations if they were as an unfair method of competition. We view unfair method of competition as linked to adverse competitive effects uh, really in a, in a different way. So that would not be something that I think we would uh, likely pursue. Yeah. Uh, so just to take that point you just made, sorry, just to take that point you just made, the realities from an operator perspective and not just instead of stepping around, let's call you know, the people that are involved here. Every operator of a transportation company has to pay Google in order to promote their services. They have to. This is a monopolistic environment that they, in order to be successful, they have to promote their stuff on, on Google. Google then turns around and finances with a $250 million investment to finance a company to come in here and to and to address this. So you have a, it's a different thing than just big money. This is a monopolistic environment that then takes that money and then brings it into this environment. So that's, that was the point I'd like you to address. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, kind of move a little bit away from the taxi industry because I'm involved uh, in the state of Washington uh, under auto transportation, which has been a needs and necessity state for a long time. They've recently relaxed their rules somewhat with their intent to improve competition. But I get the impression that you're um, <clears throat> really pretty much in favor of deregulation and open competition. The question I would have is, if you're weighing that against the, the consumer uh, interest, what about when it gets to the point of where the, the interest of a small portion of the consumer drives up the costs of the interest of other consumers, or that in fact uh, you might have an industry that just goes away altogether because when comp competition comes in and competes against the peak times, and the off-peak times can no longer be afforded. 
So on, on the first part, I would say that um, uh, we do not sort of knee-jerk take the position uh, that everything ought to be deregulated. Um, I think our presumption would be that deregulated industries work better, competitive industries work better. That's a presumption, um, but it's rebutted um, uh, in, in many instances. If you look at our, um, the, our taxi advocacies, the issue came up about uh, regulation of fares. Um, and our view has long been that if you have limited number of, uh, whether it's licenses or medallions, um, you probably need to regulate fares. And the reason is because you've created an artificial shortage. And if you didn't have any kind of fare regulation in a situation where there's a limited number of medallions, um, the prices would predictably go up. Um, uh, and the incentive would be to raise price because there'd be no reason not to. So it's not that we're saying that there that everything ought to be deregulated, and we certainly recognize that there are public safety and, and security concerns that are legitimate in this industry, and that there are new ones about data privacy um, that are coming up because of the use of apps. Um, so no, we have never taken the view that you know everything ought to be deregulated. I forget which of the speakers on the last panel was was talking, but about the cycles issue. That that's real. That's you know. I used to teach a course about this cycle issue. That we do go through these cycles of deregulation and re-regulation, trying to get it right. But part of the explanation is because the needs are different in different times, and and so it's not just kind of you know random. Uh, I guess I just wanted to point out that there's something kind of unique about the uh, transportation industry or the taxi industry because, you know, it, it, the government has no interest in whether or not you can access uh, books and music online. The government does have an interest in making sure that every one of the people in its jurisdiction have access to transportation. And I think that's how the highly managed taxi industry has come about, because it's the only way that you get on-demand, point-to-point transportation. It's also become the way that we make sure that people who can't afford private vehicles have the same access uh, to that kind of transportation. And it's also become, particularly in San Francisco, the mechanism by which we provide um, uh, transportation services to the disabled, in particular wheelchair uh, using customers. So uh, I think that the conversation has to uh, recognize that the government has an interest in maintaining that. And that's one of the threats that we see, that I see, uh, is it, it's not that we're just trying to keep competition out. It's that we, need, we know that we need to maintain this service. And that's frankly in jeopardy at this point. All right, all set. Thank you all very much.